Hey, what's happening, everybody? Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 595. Today, Andrew and I are going to revisit the subject of martial arts etiquette. Now, if you don't know me, if you don't know Andrew, if you don't know Whistlekick, you should start at whistlekick.com, see all the things that we're doing. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, co-host Andrew Adams. And is it fair to say, Andrew, that you also love traditional martial arts? Am I putting words in your mouth? No, no, that's incredibly fair to say. Okay, all right. So we both love traditional martial arts, and that's everybody involved at Whistlecake loves traditional martial arts, and that's why we do all the things that we do from this show, which you can find more out about at WhistlecakeMartialArtsRadio.com, to all the products that we have at Whistlecake.com. There's a lot going on, and if you find something at Whistlecake.com in the store that you like, use the code PODCAST15. It's going to save you 15% off. We bring you two episodes each and every week with the goal of connecting, educating, and entertaining the traditional martial artists of the world. If you want to help the show and the work that we do, there are lots of ways you can help. You could make a purchase. Like I said, you could share this or some other episode with people on social media or via email or, I don't know, just sit people down and say, listen or watch this. You could follow us on social media. We're at Whistlekick. And you could also pick up a book on Amazon. You could leave a review or support the Patreon. If you think that the new shows that we do are worth a whopping 63 cents a piece, that works out to five bucks a month. If you contribute five bucks a month to our Patreon at patreon.com slash whistlekick, we're going to give you bonus material, behind the scenes, uh, exclusive audio. Uh, let's see, what, what have we done recently? I wrote up a behind the scenes recently about what episodes were coming and a, a few just kind of thoughts on how some of them went and, and everything you get. It's it's a little bit more raw. So if, if you like the show and you find yourself listening to every episode, you're probably going to find it worthwhile to jump in on the Patreon. So, Andrew, back on, you said it was 131, episode 131. We're going way back. Yep. I did an episode solo talking about martial arts etiquette. But it's been a while. Here we are knocking on episode 600. And I think <laughs> it's time to talk about it again. And actually, this was your idea. So what what were your thoughts on what this conversation even looks like? This topic came to mind when uh, there were some etiquette, quote, quote, unquote, rules that had come up within that I had heard of at mm. either either at my dojo or uh, at, at, at other schools. Uh, and it got me to thinking, why do we? do those things some some of them i understand and make sense to me and yeah. some of them I, I i don't know that it's healthy for us to do hmm. uh, and i thought uh you know what why don't we uh why don't we discuss and unpack some of these uh, what some would consider weird uh <laughs> etiquette question and yeah. some of these to be completely honest jeremy listeners may be like oh, that's not a thing in our school i've never heard of that that's okay um there's a know, lot of every, variants there are a lot of different variants uh, a lot of different schools handle things and do things differently these are just ones that i personally thought of and you may have some as well that uh that that you may want to bring up yeah yeah I, I think it's important whatever you do and this is this is one of the things that i i feel strongly about in life if you cannot take one of your closely held beliefs and opinions and and take it and set it down and look at it and unpack it and analyze it, have conversation about it. It's not really a, a something that you should put weight into. If you can't, def if you can't defend it and part of defending it is being vulnerable about it. If you can't say like, like let's come up with something ridiculous. Um, cutting my grass. Right. I'm not doing that right now because it's winter and there's snow on the ground. But if someone says, hey, Jeremy, you don't cut your grass enough, which there are people in my neighborhood who probably think I don't cut my grass enough. <laughs> Instead of instantly getting defensive, <laughs> let's have a conversation about it. Well, why is it important to you that I cut my grass more? Here's why it's important to me that I don't cut my grass more. You're looking at it from aesthetics. I'm looking at it from the health of the ecosystem of my grass because I tend to plant things into my lawn, make more garden beds. The more I keep that grass short, right? So I'm willing to have that conversation. And if somebody convinces me, hey, actually, here, here's a reason why. See, this is where the example is getting weird. 
if here's why if you cut your grass more, it would actually be healthier for the lawn. Okay, I'll, I'll consider that. I'll take a look at it. I'll have a conversation with it. I'm not going to shut you down and say, you're wrong. I'm not going to just throw up my hands. And so some of the things that I expect we're going to talk about today are things that people would potentially just throw up their hands. Well, this is how, how we've always done it. So remember, remember, remember. Just because something is what we've always done does not mean it's something we should always do. Things end and things start. And in order for things to start, something usually has to end. You cannot have progress without change. And thus, it is important that we are willing, be willing, that it is important that we are willing to have these conversations, even if they're difficult, because it opens the opportunity for progress. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Where, where do you want to start? Are we going to go just example by example? Well, so, that takes? Uh, I mean, there are some that I think will be fairly universal. Okay. Regardless of what school or or style that that your your dojo or dojang is, and that would be things like taking off your shoes when you enter and bowing when you go on the floor. See, I actually don't think either of those are universal. Really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, the, you you get you get a lot of schools now, especially schools that are um, that have blurrier lines with fitness classes mm-hmm. that will allow people to wear shoes. Interesting. It just hasn't been my experience, I suppose. Uh, yeah, it's, and this is one of the things that I love about martial arts is that there are so many different ways of doing these things. And what I find is that different uh, rules, different etiquette creates different cultures. So for example, I've trained in one school that did not have a formal bow in process. I did not like that because I found that people were not able to as easily draw a line between what happened before and during class. Mm-hmm. Their co- their personal conversations would just kind of flow into class. And I was like, oh, I don't, I don't like this. Yep. Yep. So you could call, in that case, you could call it etiquette because mm-hmm. it's, it's a rule. It's a, uh, um, a, cultural social more is that is that the word i'm looking for there yeah i can see that 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 fits into a school or doesn't fit into another school and it has an impact Mm -hmm. and i suspect that if we however we look at these whichever ones we look at we'll find that there is an aspect of a cultural result within that school for all of them yeah and i guess it 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 holds true that most of my training has been in Japanese martial arts, Japanese Okinawan styles. Uh, and so the taking off of your shoes and bowing when you enter is, it, it could very well be a very cultural thing. Right. There's something that comes in from the geographic culture or, or mm-hmm. the the historical culture, not necessarily the martial arts culture. Yeah. And some of these are are that. Bowing. You mentioned bowing is the other semi-universal mm-hmm. one. And I, I think bowing is more common in uh, than taking off the shoes. I've seen plenty of schools where they will bow but not take off the shoes. And, and bowing isn't even always bowing as we think about it. You know, I'm tipping my head. You know, I've seen bowing be, you know, kind of a, kind of a handshake. In, in Capoeira, when you step into a hora. Yep. Yep. It's not a bow, but there is something that is exactly the same occurrence it, it, mm-hmm. or the same intent. It is, hey, we are about to, to play together, to train together, and I respect you. I acknowledge you. That's what a bow is. Yep. Yep. And and those those ones like I don't I don't have a you know a big issue on I think it's fine taking off your shoes when you enter and you know bowing is you know showing respect either to a person or to the the room that's fine but let's talk about lining up by rank yeah there's an interesting one and in my mind this comes from militaristic cultures and traditions and if we go back martial arts has an aspect of militarism to it in a lot of the ways that we think about it. Now, I can't say for certain how much of that was there before the majority of the current crop of martial arts, which had, at least in Western culture, a strong um, origination point in overseas 
military occupation. Yeah. I, I don't you're know, teaching a bunch of either. soldiers who are used to lining up. It may make sense to line them up by rank, right? Where's the other place that we could line people up by rank? It's in the military, right? Yep. I don't think those terms are accidental. I could be wrong. I, I would harbor to guess that you're correct. Um, I and it is something that happens often. Many schools line up by rank. I think um, most do. I personally am against it. Why? So I picked this up actually. This is not my. This is not just off my own dome. Um, <laughs> actually, this comes stems from a discussion I had with um, Ian Abernathy um, mm. on his thoughts on lining up and his and in his school they don't line up by rank. And his thought process is something that I have gone to think about quite a bit. If I'm a white belt, where am I lining up next to other white belts, other white belts. And if I'm in a really big class and we're doing Kihon or, you know, doing basics up and down the floor, who do I get to see? You know, all the people around me, there are other white belts. Yep. I, as an instructor would rather my white belts be looking at the brown belts or the black belt or the, the more higher ranked students so by interspersing, or I mean, and not even specifically, you go there and you go there, but just by letting people line up wherever, they get an opportunity to see other people as they're training and working out. Sure. And and what does it serve? What is the purpose? You know, this is the whole thing to me with all of these etiquette things. And, and as this will not come as a surprise to any of our listeners, I have a list. But of all the ones on my list, like there are some that that – that I think are good and serve some purposes, but what purpose does lining up by rank serve? That would be my sure. question. I, I, what was conveyed to me early on was it was a different way of getting to the same thing that you're talking about, making sure that the people of lower rank have someone to look to. Now it may not always work out, especially if you have very big classes, but if I'm in a class of 20 people, the person in front of me in line knows more than I do. Yeah, if, there's, but... if I'm in a class of 100, that may not be true. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If I'm in a class of 12 and I'm in the back, that's all but guaranteed, right? Just But, but what if you're on in one line? What's what, that? If you're in, what if you're in one line? There's nobody in front of you or nobody behind you. That would be a weirdly laid out, weirdly laid out room. Yeah, could be. And, and, I've, and I've, I've, I've seen, seen it happen. Oh, I've absolutely. seen it happen. But when it comes to now, are we talking about just lining up for the formality of entering and exiting class? Or are we talking about lining up for basics, Kihon? Well, I mean, I would say uh, as a general rule, they tend to be the same. Um, you know, they line they, up. They, for, they for do the beginning, tend to be, yes. For the beginning of class, they line up to bow in. And then you, whether you were kneeling or not, but you then you start doing class, but you're right. still standing next to the people you started class with. When I, when I think about in all my personal experiences with this, the only times where there has been a single line of people, it has been a very small class. Mm -hmm. And thus it doesn't matter what the arrangement is. You know, if there are, so like the Taekwondo, Taekwondo school I attend, except in rare instances, our lines are four wide. So if we have two, three, four people, it really doesn't matter how you arrange that order. You're going to have the same problem. If you have 12 people, you know, you've got three lines and the people in the back mm -hmm. are going to be able to see a little bit about what's going on in front. I think this comes down to what is the intent? Is yeah. the intent to showcase senior students? There's a, pro, a plus and a, a minus, a pro and a con to that. Is the intent to give newer students the ability to kind of hide and struggle through things without feeling embarrassed as they might be in the front of the line with everybody watching them. I can see a pro and a con there hmm. is the intent that the instructor only has to deal with the most senior students and can ignore the ones in the back. That's maybe not a good thing. Yeah. People aren't going to stick around. I have seen, and even when I teach, especially if I'm teaching forms, Right. Like if you think about doing forms, they generally move in multiple directions. Even if you're talking about, uh, you know, on the karate side, if you're talking about Nahanshi or, or, or Teki, you're still moving in two directions, really kind of three. You have three directions you have to care about. So I'll rearrange people. And I usually put the um, if there's somebody who's trying to learn the form or really struggling through, it, I'll put them in the middle 
mm-hmm. and I'll put the highest ranks in, you know, at, at the four corners and they always have somebody to watch. Right. So rearranging it, I, I think there's nothing wrong with that. I do like lining up in a, a, in some kind of order because I think, well, hold on, let me take a step back for that. Cause I'm usually the one in the front spot. So let me try to unpack, you know, try to separate my feelings for that. How do I feel when I'm not the person in the front spot, if I'm visiting a school or something? Um, I think that there is, depending on the, the other aspects of the culture of that school, I think as a general rule, you are going to see the people in the front of the room show up more consistently they're going to be more serious about their training, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that seeing those people doing those things consistently, being in the same spots could be, not necessarily is, but could be positive messaging to people who are newer as they start to associate behavior with results. Mm-hmm. I can, I, I get that. I can see that. Not the only way to look at it though. Yeah, sure. no, no, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Um, how about, your belt not touching the floor. There are some schools yeah. where it is incredibly disrespectful to take your belt and have it touch the floor unless you're wearing it. Right. Um, I grew up I in been, one of those. I, I grew up in one of those as well. I'm not in one currently, um, but that is an etiquette piece in, a, in many schools. So I thought that was universal because my first few schools were karate schools. Mm-hmm. And... Then I started in Taekwondo and it was not the case there. Now I'm not, I can't say for certain that no Taekwondo schools have this as a, a, a cultural aspect. As Some a definitely do. Okay. So that, that's helpful for me to know. But it really threw me because it forced me to take something, you know, kind of in, in the same vein that we're doing with this episode. It forced me to take a big step back and go, whoa, the way I do it isn't the only way to do it. And things that not only were neutral, but were important are of non-importance in this environment. And I found that really powerful because, yeah, growing up, if I had taken my belt and there's even an instance that I can remember specifically where I kind of cast my belt aside. I was I was a kid and I was being petulant. And I was, I was scolded big time in front of everyone. And then I step into this Taekwondo school and watch a belt fall off a kid. And the instructor takes it and just tosses it to the side to, so they don't trip on it. I was like, what just happened? Yep. Like, whoa. Because we do have this paradox of rank and of belts that a belt is not a big deal it's just a symbol but it is also a symbol of your time and dedication and we get this at least in in japanese okinawan martial arts from my vantage we get this conflict of what a belt is Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and i don't see that as strongly in other martial arts in you know in the same way um but i also i trained at a a kempo school where there was a formal process for putting on your belt as an individual you would go off, you would go in the corner, you would turn away from the center of the room, you would tie your belt off on one knee. Uh, there were things that you were expected co- to contemplate while doing so. And it was really, really powerful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I've. Um, this isn't one that I have strong feelings on one way or the other. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been in both schools. I, I remember the school that I'm training in now. Um, it, it had never come up because, you know, I get to the school, I just put on my belt. I mean, I... It, it's not something that we often take and just put on the ground, but at our testings, when someone gets their next rank, the old belt is taken off and thrown over the left shoulder. Mm. And the first time it happened, just like you, I was like, Whoa, Hey, uh, (laughs) that surprised me greatly, but that's just the tradition in the school. And that's just what they do. So what, what else do you have on your list? So some some other ones that are maybe slightly less known. Um, if you are out, whether you, maybe you're in your dojo having some sort of 
get together or maybe now because a lot of people are practicing outside but as the weather gets nicer mm-hmm. uh maybe you're getting together and you're having a meal and that mm-hmm. sensei is at and uh you're not allowed to eat or drink until sensei does first hmm. see this is one that i don't know where i picked this up because i don't just do this in martial arts circles i do this everywhere if i am with a group of people and there is an obvious uh figurehead like if i'm at someone's home i will defer to the people who live there Mm -hmm. i'm not going to touch my food until they do uh if i'm at let's say a big thanksgiving dinner and someone's sitting at the head of the table i'm going to watch for that person to start eating before i eat i don't eat at a restaurant if you know I don't start eating if unless the other people get also get their food, right? Like that's just something mm-hmm. I don't think that's a martial arts thing exclusively. I think that is a generalized respect thing. And it might even be more of a Western culture thing for all I know. It might be. It's not something I'm aware of being as an Eastern culture tradition. And listeners correct us if we're wrong, but it's not something that I've heard of. Um, but but this is one that I have heard like you don't you don't touch your food until sensei does. Yeah, it. If you if you look at um, like animal training, if you look at any any of the basic rules on training a dog, mm-hmm. you eat before the dog. Yep. If you look at wild animals, the alpha eats first, mm-hmm. right? This this is something that I think is pretty well ingrained in social circles, social culture. Yep. My my issue, I don't want to say issue with it. The the thing that I often think about with some of these etiquette things is I am not a fan of any etiquette that places the sensei or instructor on a pedestal and makes them better than every, he's just a person. I I will agree. There is, go ahead. And and, I know where we're going and and, I'm excited. You know, you mentioning when training animals, the the animals don't eat until we do because we're the alpha because we're better than them. That's the biggest thing. You know, yep. n- no offense to any instructor I've ever trained with. They're not better than me. Their martial arts might be better than me, but they as right. a person, they're not better than me. They're just right. a person and everyone has flaws and I don't place my instructors on a pedestal and anything that tries to subjugate the students yes. to the instructor is can be very harmful. Uh, and, etiquette and, to have and and we should probably take this subject and, and make a note and unpack it on another episode mm. Be, because there's a we could go pretty deep on this and i don't want to burn yeah. all of our time on this but yes there is a line and it can be blurry at times between being respectful to an instructor outside of the context of martial arts and being subjugated absolutely and i think a lot of it has to do with mindset like you're sitting down and not eating until the host does like that's a respect thing and that's that's can be very different as long as you in your head are thinking of it as a respect thing Mm -hmm. um i think cleaning the dojo is another one you know in in Okinawan and Japanese dojos, it's usually called sojido, which I believe literally means mindful cleaning. Mm. And, you know, as long as you are helping clean the dojo after class and, you know, the way it was intended is mindful cleaning, you're cleaning the dojo and thinking about what you trained in during the day, you know, during class, and you're using that as an opportunity to reflect and whatnot. Sure. And, and it's not used as a the instructor going, Oh, I get free labor out of this. Awesome. That's great. You know, like I I, I think a lot of it has to do with mindset. Right. It, and there also, there's a difference between, you know, if I go out to eat with a group of martial artists after a big testing versus I go out to eat with a mixed group of people. And there happens to be a couple senior martial arts students in that mix. Mm -hmm. Yep. If, if we go out to eat after testing, I consider that kind of an extension of, martial arts because it's a group of martial artists we were just together for martial arts we are inevitably going to be talking about what we just did at the competition or at the testing and so i think martial arts rules are at least vaguely applicable in mm-hmm. that case i, I think that it makes sense because everyone knows how to operate in that case and i think that that's 
really where etiquette comes from, right? It's it's a code of conduct. It's knowing how and where and when and why, because if you don't have those things, it becomes a lot more difficult to get things done. If half the class lines up and the other half is in a circle, it becomes difficult to teach to them. Yep. So when I go out with a mixed group of martial artists and non-martial artists, I'm going to default to non-martial arts rules because the non-martial artists don't know to follow the martial arts rules. So we're going to follow general societal convention. Yep. And yep. I think that makes sense. If I, 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 I can, here's an example that has nothing to do with martial arts. I, there was a summer where my sixth grade teacher, I think it was after sixth or seventh grade, I became friends with his son and I would hang out with his son and he would try to get me to call him by his first name. Mm. And that was a struggle for me. Not, not because it was a, a respect thing. And he, he, no, call me Brian. It's, it's fine. We're not, we're not in school. I spent a year calling you by your last name. It's hard for me to switch that on and off. Yep. But he gave me permission. And most of the martial arts instructors I've had outside of training have told me, call me by my first name. And I've struggled with that. And so instead in mixed company, I just don't, you, I don't refer to them by name mm, at all. I just, yep. You know, it's not it's not that I'm being overly formal. It's just that it's weird coming out that way. Hmm. Interesting. Here, here's here's another one that may or may not have been heard. Never handing money directly to the instructor. Yeah, that's a new one to me. Yeah. Um, you know, even going so far as if uh, on a testing day uh, and everyone you know is paying for their their testing, if your school does that. Uh, you would never hand the direct the money directly to the instructor. Either the instructor will have someone that will collect it for you, or when you walk up, you will place it on the table. But you're not allowed to directly hand it to them. What what does that come from? Do you know? Uh, I don't. I don't. It's not one that I've that I understand a reason or a rationale for. The, the best guess I have is that historically, um, a lot of cultures have seen money in the exchange of money as a necessary but dirty occurrence mm. and, and that very well could be i i don't know that it's one that really is critical to follow now i it just i i don't see a place for it i yeah. also don't i don't i also don't see it as a harmful etiquette piece it's just a, a kind of a strange one sure sure I'll, i agree um in a lot of schools, they'll have uh, in Japanese, it would be uh, the showman or the, the main central focus point of the room. Uh, and in some schools, only certain students are allowed to clean that. Mm. Have you heard that? I, I have not. I have not. There, there's a segmentation there that I'm I am unfamiliar with. See, I think in every school I've been in, um, the only restrictions based on rank had to do with things like uniform or curriculum. Mm. Yep, in 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 uh, some Japanese schools, uh, sojido happens after mm -hmm. class cleaning, but there are certain things that can only be cleaned by yudancha or black belts, hmm. uh, and the showman is typically one. Um, the the kami, the the main central piece up top, is often only allowed to be cleaned by the sensei or by the instructor. Do, can you can you give any context to that? Do you have any explanation as to why that is? I I don't and it's not one that i necessarily agree with because again it's it's placing certain students above others yeah in 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 a way that doesn't make sense to me like yeah. um in a training purpose yes it makes sense that black belts will will do certain things first or or you know it, it, like another one on on my list is if i as a black belt am doing a technique with a a brown belt in our school the higher ranked student always gets to practice the technique first. And to me, I, I understand that to a certain degree because the lower ranked student gets to see mm -hmm. the higher ranked student do it. So that's that, this one too. That that makes sense to me. But in terms of a cleaning thing, uh, I mean I, I my guess is that the showman is this isn't something I agree with, but I'm, I'm guessing it's something to the degree of you are not a black belt yet. So you're not worthy to touch is this that, thing. No, is, is that the place in the front of the room where a lot of schools will place uh, a yes. photo? 
Yep, exactly. Is it so? I I could imagine that a newer student may not have the context for the art to clean that space with the full ability to to be reverent and thankful to that person perhaps that and, and that and might so be so i could so rather than a restriction that seems more like maybe it grew out of or at least should be uh an opportunity that, that and you're right that could be that that might be that that's that's a guess that's a guess and of course you know people are listening and they're like oh my god you guys are killing this it's, you, and not in the good way you're ruining this, this is, <laughs> you are so wrong in every way we want to hear it right the what, what's the intent of these episodes to get you to think to open up conversation to have dialogue yeah you know, and i think if if you if you go back and, and we should we should maybe one more you got you got more Oh yeah, I've got a, okay. a couple more. A okay. couple more. We'll, we'll get through those, but the the thing that I want to point out is that we are in all of these. I think we're making a division between rules that are meant to exclude for the purposes of subjugation or mm -hmm. to elevate someone's status. Yeah are rules that neither of us are going to condone versus rules that lead to safety or progress and the betterment of training so long as they don't violate the first one yeah yeah are fine yeah I, I mean i think if if anything like anything that reinforces like a dominator hierarchy like someone is that's that's the stuff that we're not going to be going to be good with which and again a lot of that depends on the rationale behind it so one Once on my again, list why one on my list is um not training with another instructor or not even attending tournaments without asking your instructor first which would include even going to a seminar like i'm not allowed to go to a seminar unless i ask my instructor first yeah Th this is so this one is mixed for me. Mm -hmm. This is one of those where I think out of respect to my instructor, I'm going to ask or at least notify, but I also wouldn't expect that instructor to say yes. Yeah. And I think, again, it depends on what the mindset is. Like, I think if I am going to go to a tournament and I'm going to wear my school uniform at that tournament, I'm representing the school. Yep. I think the instructor has a right to know that that's going to be the case. Yep. Um, and same if I'm going to be going to train somewhere, whether it's at a seminar or at another school. The problem is often instructors see that as uh, this, my, my student wants to go train with that other instructor, so they're going to leave me. I'm right. going to say no so that they don't leave me. And this is if anybody out there watches or listens to first cup, the morning show that I do quite often, everything boils down to at least that we talk about on that show, love versus fear is motivation. You know, if, if the reasoning for the instructor to say yes or no to certain things is because they are fearful, they are probably not beneficial. Yep. Right. Fear does not create progress. Fear creates restriction. Love leads to progress. If you love your students, you will, support them. Now there's a big difference between, Hey, I've been training for eight, 10, 12 years in Goju and I want to go do jujitsu versus I've been training for two weeks in Shorinru. And I also simultaneously want to train in Shito Ru. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. There's so, of, and for, for people who may not be Japanese stylists, I'm talking about two very different arts versus two that are far more similar and one giving uh, the ability to be more diversified. Whereas if you are new and you're cross training in two similar things, it is likely to be difficult to separate one versus the other and progress. Which is why asking your instructor can lead to a good teaching moment to discuss what you're going to go learn at this seminar or wherever. So uh, again, it's all about mindset and what the rationale behind it. Um, the only other one that I thought we might, that might be fun discussing is uh well actually two one never correcting an upper ranked student 
Mm. I don't know if you've ever heard this. If <laughs> if if yeah. you are if you see like if you are a green belt kind of mid rank in in a style and you see a brown belt making doing something that you know 100% is wrong you are not allowed to tell them that they are doing it wrong you're right. not allowed to correct them yeah and, and i think that that is fair because quite often as by definition if you are a lower ranked student you have less experience less conduct uh, context less understanding your 100% certainty could still be wrong. Yep. And what if you find out, hey, there's another way of doing this that I don't get exposed to until that rank. And Absolutely. You're, so you're both right. So how do I suggest handling that? Make a note of it. And after class, you go and speak to someone, probably not that person, but someone of equal or higher rank and say, hey, I saw this. Am I doing it wrong? If you own it, if you make it about you and your desire to be better and progress, it is okay to ask that question, just not necessarily in that moment. Well, and I think it's a matter of it being a question rather than a statement. I right. I actually would have no problem if I were the under student going to the person doing it differently that I think is doing it wrong. I have no problem with that student doing that as long as they approach it in terms of, you know, wow, I saw you do this move like this, but Sensei showed me doing it like this, and I don't understand. Am I doing it wrong? I think that that's fine. That student that you approached may also, they may be doing it wrong, but you at least approached it from a question as opposed to a statement. Well, th there's a difference between you as a multi-year, multi-style, multi-don black belt rank approaching someone who is senior to you versus a green belt approaching a brown belt in the mm -hmm. original example, because you're going to be able to have a more nuanced conversation sure. even in asking the question. Yeah, no, I understand. But, but uh, even, even with I'm, even if I were a green belt, I, I think it would be okay. I, and what if your instructor does it a different way? I mean, I mean, how do you, who, who do you then go to? You know, so like that, last, that's why I, I suggest a third party because I yeah. think you could have a more honest conversation because there are schools it, I've trained in them where instructor teaches things in different ways to different people at different times. I've trained in schools where the instructor has multiple arts in their background and sometimes they forget what they're teaching. Flip flop. Or, yep. yep. Uh, or maybe they have some kind of chronic injury that impacts the way they teach things. Um, I've had instructors who, for other reasons beyond chronic injury, just aren't capable of doing things the quote-unquote right way. So what they will say and what they will do will be slightly different because they want you to do it the right way per the curriculum, even though they are not permitted to do that. It usually happens with yeah. more complicated kicking techniques. Yep. But the third party is interesting to me because quite often, especially so in most schools I've been in, there has been that at least one really friendly, really approachable black belt who is not the instructor. Mm -hmm. And you can go to them and say, hey, I saw Tom or Sue doing this and I thought it was this. What's up? And by going to that person, yep. one of a few things happens. Okay, so yeah, Tom was right. You haven't learned this yet. You know, Sue does it this way because there's something going on with her, her hip. Or, you know, I've been wondering about that myself. Let me fall on the sword and I'll go talk to the instructor. Or let me go talk to Tom and Sue. Yeah, and figure it out creates why. creates more. There's actually, there could be a lot of benefit for multiple people beyond you in mm -hmm. raising the question. Yeah. And it, the problem with going to someone who is a brown belt when you're a green belt is that that brown belt is probably not confident enough in their abilities yet to be willing to be vulnerable and say, you know what, maybe I'm doing it wrong. And that's the difference, you know, that I'm pointing out with you as someone yeah. who's been training a while. You're willing to be vulnerable and say, you know what, hey, I was wrong. I've been doing it wrong for a while. Mm -hmm. we, most of us who've been training for a while have had at least one thing where we've looked back and gone, I've been doing it wrong this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> right oh oh man and you have to have a level of of training and confidence in your skill and who you are as a person right there's there's an ego yeah. suspension here to be able to to open up to that and 
I think it is it is better, right? So we're talking about these things in a very open way. And I think being open about etiquette, if you're if you're an instructor or school owner, and not just explaining, we bow when we line up. Why? Make sure once in a while you explain the why. What is the why behind yep. these rules of etiquette? Because that leads to the culture that you want. If you just put in place the regulations, it may or may not lead to the culture. But if you give people the reason, okay, I want you to go clean. I want you to clean and I want you to reflect on what you did at class today while you're cleaning. Those are two very different experiences yeah, that absolutely. Cre create two very different results and cultures within the school. Yep. Yep. The, I, I think the, the way we, we, you know, just really quickly finishing up on the, uh, the correcting students thing. Yeah. Uh, etiquette wise coming at it from a question. Here's a perfect example. Uh, my instructor has been teaching knife on or techie for mm -hmm. on zoom and for the students that are at home. Mm -hmm. And so because he's helping the students out, he's looking at the camera. And so he will start instead of going to the right, he'll start going to the left <laughs> to so that, so that he'll mirror the students, right? Yeah. So that he can, so that the students at home go the correct way. Right. And Naifanchi is one of those few kata that you are, you can do either way. It's the same kata, really. You can do it on both sides. It's not, you know, doing another kata on the exact opposite side can be a little more difficult at times. So he has gotten used to starting to the left. He was doing an in-person class, starting to do it to the left, because that's what he's been practicing for the Zoom students. And if a student were to say, Sensei, you're doing it wrong, it goes to the right, remember? That would be very bad etiquette, as opposed sure. to... Sensei, I'm I'm sorry. I thought that this went to the right and you're going to the left. I just want to make sure I have it correct. That is way more appropriate etiquette wise to, yep. to pose and, it as a question, not and, as a you're doing it wrong. And that is a good reason to to circle back for having people line up by rank. Yeah. Because you can okay, what are the people immediately in my uh, training context doing? Oh, they're all going to the right. We're all going to the left. Okay. I'm yep. probably wrong. Yep. And the last one that I thought we could discuss was not wearing your gi or your belt outside in public. Some schools don't have an issue. Some schools do. What's the rationale behind it? So there, there are two different situations we're talking about. We're talking about putting it on and traveling to and from training versus putting it on and wearing it like a costume. Yep. Okay. Uh, there is a rare third exception where a uh, 16 year old Jeremy gets really excited because he is gifted a blue gi when he earns <laughs> his black belt and really likes the pants despite them not having pockets and wears it to school a couple times. Just the pants. <laughs> I don't think we have to spend much time on the third one. <laughs> um, Halloween costume, et cetera, anything that um, suggests the the uniform, whatever that is. That could be your T-shirt and shorts if, if there is official designated T-shirt and shorts in the yep. school. Anything that is that is the official training apparel being used in something that is not training, I think is disrespectful to you as the student i don't think it's necessarily disrespectful to anyone else but for me when i put on gi dobak because those are the two styles of uniform that i wear it helps me get in the right mindset for training if i was to wear those things elsewhere it would dilute that impact yeah yeah i i would agree i would agree i um some schools are okay with you wearing your gi or dobok from your house to the do to the training hall and then when you get to the hall you're allowed to put on your belt some schools yep. do not allow you to wear your belt outside of the training hall yep and that that's more what i am used to seeing yep me uh, as well. I, I was trained that you don't put the belt on until you get into the environment that you're going to train in yeah and, and i'm sure there are schools out there that don't want you to wear anything outside in which case you better have a bunch of training uh, changing rooms yep and i i can see value to all the above right if, if you've got kids 
and you live in New England and it's mud season, which for those of you who don't live in areas that have mud season, it literally it's it's like a fifth season. It uh, is. It, it's it is it is dirty and kids will show up in class with mud splatters from ankle to neck up the back of their uniform. Because they stepped in a puddle because they're kids. Yep. Well, if they're not wearing their uniform to class and they're changing when they're there, it's less likely to happen. But then you've got a whole other issue of, of coordinating that. Yep. But that, that those were the last of the things on my list, pretty much. And and so, again, those seem to sum up or, or to fall into that, that dichotomy of, is it about respect and benefit of training or is it about subjugation and hierarchy and ego mm -hmm. which and, in a lot of cases has to do with how you're thinking about e exactly it. exactly and and again just to reiterate and i'm sure you're on board with me i think you already said you were if you are conveying rules of etiquette explain the why if you don't know the why figure it out if you if i come up to you if i'm a student and i say instructor why do we do this and you don't have an answer beyond well it's what we've always done i would urge you that the next words out of your mouth be but let me figure it out and get back to you i haven't thought about it that way it's just what i've always done mm -hmm. because the why matters yep i would agree okay. we talk about you know why in terms of why do we do these movements in this way why do we do this form what is the application why matters find the why yep absolutely okay all right well Thanks, everybody, for listening or watching. Yes, there is a video episode or video version of this episode. And thanks, Andrew. This is a good topic. I'm glad I'm glad we did this one. If you want to go deeper, you know, maybe get some transcripts or check out episode, what was it, 131, the original etiquette episode that I did, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can find that. Everything else that we do, remember, we do two shows every week. And if you're down to support us in all of our work, you've got some options. You can leave a review, buy a book on Amazon, or help out with the Patreon patreon.com slash whistlekick. And if you're looking for the ideal strength and conditioning program for martial artists, I made it. You can get it at whistlekick.com. Use the code podcast15 to get 15% off that program or anything else we make. And if you have suggestions, let's hear them. Our social media is at whistlekick and my emails, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, train hard smile, and, and have, have a great, a great day. day.